Hello and welcome back. Today I want to look at some more tips and tricks related to LT Spice, various features and quirks that should make the use of the program a bit easier, faster and more productive. So if you're curious, then keep watching. First thing to look at is the latest available version. So at the time of filming, LT Spice version 24.0.12 can be downloaded from the analog website. Now, if you think you've missed a few versions, don't worry, LT Spice has a similar numbering system to Windows. The first widespread version was version 4. Then you had 17, there was a 17.1 at some point, and now they're up to 24. Now I predict that the next major version will be 31. Anyway, numbering aside, once you turn on the program, you will notice that it looks a bit different from what you might have been used to. Now, I don't mean the background picture, you rarely see that anyway, but rather I'm referring to the symbols of the various shortcuts. Now, if you're a new user, this will probably not matter, but for an older user, these can be quite a bit confusing. So the first tip of the day is how to make this look a bit more familiar. So for this, we need to go under Tools, Settings, and here under Operations, we need to first change the toolbar style from default to Legacy, so we can already see the change going on in the background. And if we want to, we can also play around with the toolbar icon sizes. So maybe you want them smaller, maybe you want them bigger. This is all based on your own preferences. Now, another thing different in version 24 are the exact key shortcuts. So if we go under the settings schematic tab and we go to keyboard shortcuts, we can select either the default version 24 shortcuts or we can go for the classic shortcuts available in the previous versions. Now, of course you can edit any of these. So simply double clicking and giving some other value. And you can edit all of these except the non-configurable ones. So these will have to stay the way they are. Anyway, once you set the shortcuts to the way you want them, you can also save them or load them from a previously saved file. So anyway, this could be considered the next tip. First of all, check out the various shortcuts that exist. And second, configure them to your own preferences. So if you work with other electronics related CAD software, like a schematic or layout editor, you may already have some predefined shortcuts that you're used to. So to make life easy, you can use the same shortcuts over multiple programs. Anyway, the next tip that you might already know is a small quality of life feature, and this refers to drawing out schematics. So other than using the various shortcuts that we looked at, so for example, D for diode, L for inductor, R for resistor, and so on, if multiple components need to be connected in series, you can simply draw a single line through all of them and this will automatically interconnect them without creating short circuits in between the pins. So this will be much faster than drawing individual lines in between the components. Now it's important to remember though that this feature does not work with lines. So drawing one line over another line will not create an intersection. For that, you need to start from the line and go on. So an intersection will be clearly marked by having a square over the lines. Now, I want to take a step back into the real world and highlight a feature which is present in almost all modern day digital oscilloscopes. The possibility to save the measured waveform, not just as a picture, but as a CSV or other text-based format. Just as an example, I will be saving the current waveforms as a CSV. So what we have here is a calibration signal on the first channel and just a generic noise on the second channel which is left open. So we can save this and we can later process this on the computer. So the tip here is that the real life waveform can be imported into the simulator for further processing if it's in the right format. So at least for my oscilloscope, the output CSV file needs to be processed a bit. 
So for importing, you only need the timestamp value and the measurement value. So these need to be packed into pairs. Now, another observation is regarding the exact time value. So in this file, the value is starting from the trigger point, which is somewhere in the middle of the measurement. So the first time point is a negative something value. And well, the simulator cannot work with negative time values. So we need to fix this. So for that, I added in a new column with an extra cell, which takes the previous value and just adds in the very first timestamp value. And then this is copied in for every single cell going down the line. So now time starts with zero and then increments from here. Last thing to mention is that the exact time value that we will be copying for further processing needs to have all of its significant digits clearly marked out. So we need to set the number formatting to highlight this. Finally, we can select the time and value pairs and copy everything into a text file, which can be saved under whatever name you wish. And well, I did a similar file for the second channel. So now we can go back to the simulator to actually use the files that we've created. I've added in a voltage source, which is of the type PVL file, into which I added in the exact name of the text file. So you can either browse the exact location on your computer or just add in the name if it's in the exact same folder as the simulation. So I did the same thing for both of the channels. And well, if we now run the simulator and we wait a bit, so these are quite large files. There's about 700,000 points in each of them. So it does take a while for the simulator to load them. But eventually these do get loaded in and we can just plot them out. And we get the exact same thing that we had in the oscilloscope. Now, the final thing to mention is that if the simulation time is longer than the data that was provided, the simulator will just take the last value and go with that. So the straight bit on both of our measurements is not part of the initial file. It was just the last value and it was copied until the end of the simulation time. Now, in a similar fashion, you can also use a spectrum analyzer in the same way. So to export a measurement in a text-based file. So again, just as an experiment, I've connected the input to a generic antenna and I'm measuring the FM frequency range just to have an example measurement. So if we stop this, in the various menus, we can select that we want a CSV type of format. And after giving a generic name, we should be able to save our measurement as a text-based file. And this can later be used in an AC type of simulation. But again, we will need a bit of processing to do this. However, before that, let's first look at how the actual import is supposed to look like, since it's not really described in the documentation. So the way in which I found that this can be done is by using behavioral sources. So this is not the generic voltage source, but rather a behavioral voltage source. And this can be either of voltage or current type. And this needs to be linked to a reference value. So for this, I used the, another voltage source. So this is a voltage source of value AC1. So this has the small signal AC amplitude of one. So the voltage on this source has been used as a reference, which is then multiplied using the frequency function with data triplets. So here we have three different values. One stands for frequency, the next for amplitude, and finally phase. So just as an example, I created a source with three points. So 87, 100, 108 megahertz with different amplitudes, zero, one, and zero, and different phases. And if we run the simulation and we look at the voltage present on this voltage source, we see the exact values that were inserted into the description of this behavioral voltage source. So this is the basic way in which you can import frequency-based amplitude and phase data into an AC simulation. Anyway, coming back to the measurement that was performed with the spectrum analyzer, the file that was saved out looks something like this. So we have our trace name, 
the measurement frequency points and the measurement amplitude expressed in dBm. Now, for simplicity, we will consider the phase as being zero, so we just need the amplitude information. And while well, a bit of spreadsheet wizardry later, I came up with this thing. So I created a column with a parenthesis, a column that just has a space, I removed the dBm, and then added an extra space and zero and an extra parenthesis. So I did this for every single data point, and then I created a final cell that uses the concatenate function to put everything together. So now we have sets of frequency, amplitude, and phase between parentheses and with spaces in between. So now this can be copied and put directly into the simulator. So I kept the vref and frequency function in the description of the behavioral voltage source. And after that, I added in all of the data points. So if we now look at how this voltage source looks like, we see the exact spectrum that we've previously measured. Now, if you don't want to have a very, very long string of data attached to your behavioral voltage source, you can, of course, do this in a much nicer way. So you can simply create a sub-circuit that contains all of the data. So it contains the voltage source with the AC value of one, and then it contains the behavioral source with the various data points, and then simply include this into the simulator. And with this, with a basic voltage source, which was set of the type X, so for sub-circuits, we have the exact same thing, but now the simulation looks much, much nicer. For the next step, we need to stay in the AC type of simulation to observe the various features that the plot window allows. So for this example, I have a basic circuit and I just added in an extra .NET statement. So if we run the simulation by default, when plotting a quantity in an AC type of simulation, so let's just take the current running through L1, you get the complex data displayed as a magnitude and phase pair. And the first important observation here is that the phase currently can take any value. But if you right click on it, you can select the phase to be plotted as either raveled or unraveled. The difference being that you can limit it to go between plus minus 180 degrees, whereas the unraveled one does not have this limitation. And this can make analyzing phase a bit easier, since in some cases you can end up with thousands of degrees of phase shift, which can become quite confusing. Now, if we go back, the other major expression method is group delay. So rather than expressing phase as a phase shift, you can express it as a time delay. And this can come in quite handy when analyzing filters or other circuits. So this will express by how much the time signal is delayed from the reference. Anyway, turning now to the magnitude axis, here again we can right click and we have the option to change the display method. So either we go for decibels, we use a logarithmic scale, we can use a linear scale. But the other interesting possibility is to change the exact representation from a Bode type of plot to either a Nyquist or a Cartesian plot. So specifically with the Cartesian, we get pairs of real and imaginary values. And this is especially helpful when we are trying to plot out impedances. So if I just leave the input side impedance, we get nice sets of real and imaginary pairs for every single frequency point. So this way of expression might come in handy in certain cases. The last subject to discuss today refers to loads used on the output of a circuit. So this could be the load of a power supply or some other power consumer. The exact situation will be of course use case dependent. But the actual tip here is how to set one or another parameter for the load. Now for this example, I will be using a voltage source that is a ramp going from zero to 10 volts in a certain amount of time. And the source also has a one ohm internal resistance. And now one common implementation when you want to use constant resistance is to use a basic resistor. This is nice and all, 
but it does have the downside of having a voltage dependent current. I mean, that's how a resistor is supposed to work, of course. But what if you want to fix something? Let's say the current. Well, for that, you can use a current source. But you might quickly notice that under the right circumstances, the circuit will start to do strange things. So here on the left side, if we look at the voltage present on the current source, it starts off with a negative value, even though our voltage source starts from zero. So in reality, the reason why this is happening is that the current source is a source. It will force the specified current of one ampere, no matter what is on the outside of this component. So in this case, when the voltage source is at zero, the only way to have a one ampere current is to have a minus one voltage on our one ohm series resistance. Now, the way to fix this is to make the current source an actual load. So if we right click on our current source, we can specify that we want it to be an actual load, so not a source. And by doing this, the source will only draw current if there is an external voltage present. So if we look at the voltage present on our second circuit, we can see that it clearly starts from zero and from there it goes up. So our current source is not forcing a current when there is no external voltage present. So the current also starts from zero and then stabilizes at one when there is sufficient external voltage. Now, in some cases, you will not want a fixed current, but rather a fixed voltage. So when modeling something like an LED, and for this, we can use a dedicated voltage source in series with an ideal diode so that the voltage source doesn't end up supplying our circuit. And while the diode needs to be as ideal as possible, so I made here a very basic model for it that has a forward voltage of zero, or well, you can make your life easy and just use an ideal diode in which the forward voltage is of the value that you want. So if we run this simulation, and we look at the voltage present on our ideal component, we can see that it will increase starting from the supply and then stabilize at the fixed value that we set with our model. So this occurs with both of our circuits. And the final type of load to mention today is the constant power load. So in certain cases, you might want to draw a fixed amount of power under various voltage or current conditions. And while well, to implement this, you will need a behavioral source. So this can be either a behavioral voltage or a behavioral current source. And to get it to draw a constant power, in the definition, you simply need to use the syntax P equals something, where the something is the power expressed in watts. So in this example, this is set to one watt. So if we run this, we can look at the voltage, we can look at the current, we can see that these have various shapes, but we can also plot the power. So by holding the Alt key going over our source, we get this thermometer appearing. And now still holding the Alt key, if I left click, we get the power automatically calculated and plotted out. So we can observe that once we have sufficient voltage, the power stabilizes and it does stay at the one watt threshold. So depending on your specific use case, you can either fix resistance, voltage, current, or power in the loads that you're using. Now, LT Spice is a good circuit simulator, and it will help you in your various endeavors, but only if you know how to use it properly. So hopefully you found something useful today. And with that said, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye-bye.